So, uh, let us now look at an example to illustrate the, the two models that we have discussed prior to the break, uh, the infinitesimal time model and also the finite time model. Let us start with the first one. Consider a stock that pays no dividends, has a volatility sigma of 30 percent per annum and provides an expected return mu of 15 percent per annum with continuous compounding. It has the current price of 1000. What is the probability of a price increase of 54? Price increase of 54 or more in one week. This is very important. You take you need to take note of this fact that we are talking about a time of one week. Assume that one week qualifies as an infinitesimally small time period, so that we can use the usual stock price model for infinitesimal time period also assumes that one week is equal to 0 0.0192 of a year. So, here it is explicitly given that we need to use the infinitesimal model, we need not use the finite time model. So, volatility is given at 30 percent that is 0 0.30, expected return is given as 15 percent on continuous compounding basis that is 0 0.15, the current price is given as 100. Uh, 1000, I am sorry, uh, the time is given as one week that is equal to 0 0.0192 of an year. In the infinitesimal model, the change in the stock price d s is normally distributed with the mean is equal with the mean equal to mu into s into d t. This is the mean and variance is equal to sigma square s square d t standard deviation is equal to sigma s under root d t where s is the current stock price. Please note that fact. So, the mean is equal to mu into s into d t which works out to 2.88 using the values that we have here. Mu is equal to 0 0.15, s is equal to 1000, d t is equal to 0 0.0192 and the standard deviation is equal to sigma s under root d t. Again, we use this value with respective values and we find that the standard deviation is equal to 41. Point 5692. The desired price increase is 54 and therefore, the z value that we get because please note these are normally distributed um, d s is normally distributed. So, we do calculations by calculating the z value and then uh, using the standard normal distribution tables. So, we calculate the z value. How do we calculate the z value? Sigma is given to us. This is sigma uh, or standard deviation. And this is the standard deviation, this is the mean and this is the increase in value. So, we can find out the z, what is z? z is equal to x minus x power upon sigma. So, desired price increase is 54, the mean of uh, d s is equal to 2.88 and the standard deviation is 41.56. So, 54 minus 2.88 divided by 41.56 is equal to 1.23 approximately. Now, we can use the normal distribution tables and we find that the required probability is equal to 0 0.1093. So, that is how this problem is to be worked out. This is the normal distribution table which you can use and you can see that 1.23, 1.23 corresponds to a value of 0 0.3907, but this is the value of the shaded area. What we are concerned with is this area. Uh, and therefore, uh, we subtract um, this expression that we have here 1.23 0 0.3907, we subtract it from 0 0.5 and we arrive at the required value of 0 0.1093. Now, let us do another example. The price of a stock follows the log normal distribution with mu, log normal distribution this is again important. You have to be very careful about understanding the problem, the language that is used in the problem. The price of a stock follows the log normal distribution with a mu of 17 percent per annum and a volatility sigma of 20 percent per annum. The current stock price is 100. What is the probability of this price increasing to more than 149 at the end of 2 years from now? Now, this is 2 years. So, obviously, there is no question of using the infinitesimal model, we have to use the log normal model. Please note, even if the question did not specifically mention that the stock price follows the log normal model, we would we should have 
we use the log normal model because the time that is given to us is 2 years which is a substantially long period of time and certainly by no means can be classified as infinitesimal. So, here the expected return is given as 17 percent, volatility is given as 20 percent, the current stock price is S naught is equal to 100 and the projected stock price is 149. We want to find the probability of the stock price going beyond 149. The time horizon is given as 2 years. So, the expected value of log S t is equal to log S 0 plus mu minus 1 by 2 sigma square t and when you substitute all these values, we get the expected value of log S t as 4.9057 and the standard deviation of log s t is equal to sigma root t which works out to 0 0.2828. So, we have the mean value, we have the standard deviation, uh, but we need to work out log of s t where s t is the target value. The target value in our case is 149. So, log of uh, 149 is given by given as 5.0039. So, using the three values 1, 2 and 3, we can calculate the z value. How do we calculate the z value? It is equal to 5.0039 minus 4.9052 divided by 0 0.2828 and that turns out to be 0 0.3492. Then we will use the normal distribution tables to find out the value of uh, the uh, standard normal variate exceeding the value of 0 0.3492 and we find out its probability to be 0 0.3632. Now, we look at the difference uh, uh, between the two models. Uh, uh, this is uh, something which is interesting. How much in, uh, inaccuracy percolates into our analysis when we use the infinitesimal model in lieu of the finite time model. So, I have worked it out in two situations where firstly, where the time is equal to 1 week and secondly, where the time is equal to 1 year. So, I have used this data which is here on the slide. Instantaneous return is 0 0.15, standard deviation is equal to 0 0.3 that is 30 percent per annum and that is volatility. Current stock price is 1000 and uh, expected stock price is 1054. The time frame is 1 week for the first uh, illustration. Uh, using this data, we have the mean as uh, 100.8846. Uh, uh, please note the mean is given by mu into s into d t and the standard deviation is equal to 41.60. We had worked it out earlier Sig sigma into s into under root d t and that gives us a z value corresponding to our chosen price of 1054 as 1.2286. Now, let us use the uh, finite time model for doing the same analysis. Mm, the log of s is given as 6.9077, where s is equal to mm, the stock price is 1000. So, log of 1000 is 0 6.9077. Mean of log s is equal to mm, the usual expression log of s naught plus mu minus 1 by 2 sigma square into t, where t is equal to 1 week, mu and sigma are already given to you, log of s naught is equal to 6.90. So, mean of log of s is equal to 6.9097. Standard deviation of log s is equal to sigma under root d t in our case, you can write it as t as well, that is equal to 0 0.04160. And now, log of s t, what is s t? s t is equal to 1 0. 54 st so log of 1054 is equal to 646.9603 and that gives us the z value of 6.99603 6.9603 z is equal to 6.9603 minus 6.9098 6.9098 divided by 0 0.0416 that gives that is equal to 1.2156. So, if I use the finite time model for the same analysis as I use for the uh, 
uh, infinitesimal model I get a z value of 1.2156 compared to the z value of 1.2286 for if I use the infinitesimal value. Let us see. So, th these are pretty close to each other. So, if you if our time horizon is one week we can as well uh, do an uh, a reasonable job using the infinitesimal model without bothering about the finite time model, but the situation changes radically when we look at a model uh, look at a time frame of one year that is illustrated in this example here and you find um, that in the short term model the z value turns out to be minus 0 0.32 whereas in the long term uh, in the finite time model it turns out to be minus 0 0.174. So, there is a huge difference between the z values that we calculate um, if the time frame is increased from one week to one year. That is the reason that uh, if when we talk about uh, uh, a long duration uh, for predicting the price we should be using the the finite time model for sh very short periods that infinitesimal model is good enough. Another example a stock price follows a log normal distribution with a mu of 12 percent and a sigma of 30 percent calculate the probability that the stock price at the end of 9 months will be greater than its expected price at that time. The first step is to work out the expected price and the expected price that you find is equal to 1094.17. How can you find out the expected price? you are given the current price S naught which is equal to 1000, you are given the continuously compounded return mu is equal to 12 percent, the time is equal to 0 0.75. So, the expected price is equal to E of S t is equal to S naught e to the power mu t where uh, everything is given to us t is equal to 9 months, mu is equal to 12 percent, S naught is equal to 1000. So, that gives us E of S T as 1094. Now, knowing this expected price it is quite simple we have worked it out in the previous example how to find out the probability corresponding to a given target price and uh, um, using that methodology um, what we find is that the probability is equal to 0 0.4483. Okay. So, so far so good. Uh, we have talked about the stock price modeling part of the course, we talked about the infinitesimal model where uh, the stock price or the change in the stock price was normally distributed with a mean equal to mu s d t and a variance equal to sigma square s square d t. Then we using the Eto equation or for that matter the Fokker Planck equation, we found that over a finite time period the stock price follows the log normal distribution. In other words log s t follows the normal distribution, s t follows the log normal distribution and the mean is given by a log of s naught plus mu minus 1 by 2 sigma square into t and a variance equal to sigma square s square into uh, sigma square into t I am sorry, variance equal to sigma square into t. Now, our next step is to use this model use this this models that we have discussed so far in order to ascribe a value using arbitrary considerations as well. We try to ascribe a value to the derivatives to a particular derivative. We start with the simplest form of derivatives that is the European derivatives and of course, they can be extended to the American derivatives as well. Although we do not have time uh, sufficient time in our uh, Course structure to cover the uh, pricing of American derivatives, we shall confine ourselves to European derivatives, and in that we shall confine ourselves to the Black Scholes model. So, let us start with the assumptions of the Black Scholes model. But before I go into the assumptions of the Black Scholes model, here is a, a, a notation uh, uh, which uh, I shall be following throughout. If z is normally distributed with a mean of 0 and a variance of 1, that is, if z is the standard normal variate then the probability that capital Z is less than equal to any predetermined value alpha is written as capital phi of alpha. Let me repeat this is very important and this will feature again and again in what is going to follow. If capital Z is normally distributed or is a standard normal variate then the probability that capital Z is less than equal to alpha is represented as phi alpha. So, basically what we are trying to say is suppose this is my normally distribu normal distribution. If this is any point alpha then the this whole probability will be called k 
capital phi of alpha. Cumulant, this is called the cumulative normal probability distribution function, cumulative normal distribution function. Let me repeat again once more, if z is normally distributed with the mean of 0 variance of 1, it is the standard normal variate. Then, if it is, if z is the standard normal variate, then given any predetermined value alpha, the probability of z lying less than alpha is written as capital phi of alpha. And using the probability density function, we can write it in this form. Now, this is another uh, um, simple proof that we need to take keep track of. I will not get into the nitty gritty of the proof, but at the same time, this is what is um, what is proved here 1 minus capital phi of alpha, where capital phi is the cumulative normal distribution function 1 minus capital phi of alpha is equal to capital phi of minus alpha. Let me repeat 1 minus capital phi of alpha is equal to capital phi of minus alpha. The proof is a straight forward uh, exercise in integration and I will leave it as an exercise for the uh, learners. Let us now move over to the assumptions underlying the Black Scholes model. Number 1, the stock price follows the normal log normal process with constant mean return and volatility. In other words, both the mean return and volatility are not functions of time. This is the first assumption. So, they are the they follow a generalized Brownian motion. The stock price follows the log normal process with constant mean return and volatility. Short selling of securities with full use of proceeds is permitted. Short selling of securities with full use of proceeds is permitted. There are no transaction costs or taxes, all securities are perfectly divisible. There are no dividends during the life of the derivative, there are no riskless arbitrage opportunities, security trading is continuous, the risk free rate of return R is constant and the same for all maturities. That is the term structure of interest rates is flat. Okay. So, with these assumptions, with armed with these assumptions, we now proceed to the derivation of the Black Scholes model. The stock price follows the stochastic differential equation given by this expression. We all know that um, we have discussed it right at the beginning of the previous lecture. Um, d s is equal to mu s d t plus sigma s d w or d s is normally distributed with a mean of mu s d t and a variance of sigma square s square d t. The Eto's lemma also we are familiar with given g as a, as a function of a stochastic variable x, where x follows the stochastic differential equation given by expression 4 and, uh, and is also an explicit function of time. We get an expression for the differential of g as equation number 3. So, this is given to us, the stock price model is given to us which is equation number 2 and uh, the Eto's equation is given as equation number 3, d x is equal to a d t plus b d w, this is equation number 4, not, not much to explain here. Now, we set g equal to f of s comma t, where f is a derivative, because it is a function of s and what is s? s is a stochastic variable, and s is a stochastic process, it is a stock price, a stock price follows a stochastic process. So, s represents a stock price and which is a stochastic process t is uh, explicit uh, time uh, dependence uh, if required, mm, we shall be coming back to it in a uh, later point. x is equal to s, a is equal to mu into s, b is equal to sigma into s, all these are obtained by comparison of equation number 2 with equation number 4, x is equal to s, a is equal to mu s, b is equal to sigma s. Uh, g is equal to f of x t, f of s t common sorry. Then when we substitute all these values uh, into the into the equation or the Eto equation that is equation number 3, what we get is equation number 6. So, so far it is only a manipulation of um, quantities, uh, algebraic manipulation of quantities, nothing else, uh, but we now come to the more important part. If you recall, when we talked about the pricing of uh, uh, derivatives using the binomial model, what did we do? We created a portfolio which comprised of the derivative 
and the underlying asset opposite position in the underlying asset in delta units of the underlying asset. And then we showed that we can construct such a portfolio and it has uh, uh, no risk embedded in it. In other words, the stochasticity or the randomness in the derivative is neutralized by the randomness uh, in the in the underlying asset and as a result of which what we get is a, a product a, a combination a portfolio that is devoid of any randomness that is devoid of any stochasticity and therefore, that should lead, give us by arbitrage considerations that should give us the risk free rate of return. Precisely the same methodology we are going to follow here we construct a portfolio which consists of one unit of the derivative and minus del f upon del s units of the stock minus del f upon del s units of the stock. Let us call this portfolio pi capital pi. So, capital pi is a portfolio that consists of one unit of the derivative let us say a long position in one unit of the derivative and a short position that is what this minus sign represents. So, a short position in uh, del, del f by del s units of the stock. From where did we get this del f upon del s? I will come back to it in a minute, but the value of this portfolio is given by equation number 7. f, f is the cost of the derivative minus del f upon del s, this is the number of units of the underlying asset uh, into s, s is the price per unit of the underlying asset. Change in the value of pi due to a small change in d s, small change d s in s in time d t is given by expression number 8. This is straightforward difference, uh, differentiation. So, we do not have much to explain here. Now, this d in, in this exp expression d f we have already worked out. Where have we worked out? We have worked out in equation number 2. This was equation number, no we have worked out in equation number 6 and as far as d s is concerned d s we have got in equation number 2. So, both these expressions d f and d s are available to us this is here in equation number 6 and this is here in equation number 2. Now, the important point you see where did we get this del f upon del s quantity in this number for constituting the risk less portfolio. If you look at this equation number 6 the coefficient of d w in equation number 6 is sigma s del f upon del s. The coefficient of d w see why I am talking about d w because d w gives you the randomness d w is the only component in these equations which captures the randomness it is the infinitesimal Brownian motion increment. So, it is where the randomness in this uh, processes is embedded. So, the coefficient of d w in equation number 6 is sigma s del f upon del s. The coefficient of d w in equation number 2 is sigma into s. Now, if these two randomness terms are to cancel each other or to annul each other clearly we need to multiply this expression by del f upon del s and then also a negative sign because then when we add the two terms these expressions will cancel out and that is precisely you will see that that is precisely what is happening. So, this is the reason this is the source of this expression minus del f upon del s that we find here in this equation. This is uh, this is not uh, from uh, you know this is not arbitrary this is given by the the relations that we have between the um, pr process the stochastic process followed by the underlying asset and the process followed by the derivative asset. So, okay. so um, the change in the value of pi due to small change in d s is given by this expression this is simple. Now, when we put the values from equation number 6 this is equation number 6 please note this part is equation number 6 and this part is this part is equation number 2 we find you can clearly see what I have been explaining just now this part and this part cancels out. You can see here it is what sigma s del f upon del s into d w and you can see here del c upon del s or del f c it should be f here I am sorry del f upon del s into sigma s d w same terms opposite sign. 
So, they should cancel each other and they indeed cancel each other and what we get is this expression which is equation number 9. And please note this expression contains no randomness, it does not contain any term containing d w, it does not contain any term containing Brownian motion, Brownian motion increment and therefore, there is no randomness in this term. This is a this is the equation which is followed by the risk free portfolio which is represented by a merger a combination of the derivative and del f upon del s units of the underlying asset. Now, equation 9 does not contain any stochastic term. Hence, the portfolio is uh, capital pi, the portfolio capital pi is risk free and will generate risk free rate of return over the interval d t. So, that this gives us if you can see it is quite elementary when you uh, substitute the respective values you get equation number 10. So, what do we have from here? What do we have we carry forward from the previous slide? We from the previous slide we carry forward two expressions for the same d pi. One is equation number 9, the other is equation number 10. The job is now easy, we simply need to equate the two and what we get is equation number 11, which is the celebrated black Scholes partial differential equation. When you solve this equation for a derivative, the result that you get is the valuation is the price or the value of the derivative uh, product. So, this is the black Scholes. So, for European call boundary conditions, the, these are basically terminal conditions. For European call options, we have F of ST, comma capital T, where capital T is the maturity rate of the option is equal to C, S capital T, T is equal to max, you know the payoff function. So, as you see, the point is at the date of maturity of the option, the price of the option must equal its payoff that is precisely what is being used here similarly for the put option. And when you use this boundary conditions and solve the partial differential equation that we have here, these are the results that you get. And this may, they seem slightly involved, but with a little bit of exercise with a little bit of practice you would be able to manage to re recall these results. They are fundamental, they are very very important and, uh, and they would definitely constitute, they would definitely uh, be problems based on these uh, equations uh, in your exercises, assignments and, uh, and the final exam. And this, uh, this is the, these are the, these are the same uh, results, but in the context of dividend paying stock. You can see here, the effect stock, uh, stock price S naught is replaced by the effective stock price S naught minus T naught, where D naught is the present value of dividend that is the only change that occurs here. This is options on indices, formula for options on indices, where you have a continuously compounded return given on the underlying asset. The, the skew is the continuous compounded return on the underlying asset. So, in this case, this additional factor of Q comes into play. And similarly, in the case of currencies, this factor of R f, which is the risk free rate for the foreign country uh, comes into play when you are talking about options or products on foreign currencies. I will continue from here in the next lecture. Thank you.